Okay, so we're starting chapter 9 today, and this is a video for section 9.1, which is all about the idea of sampling distributions, which we're going to talk about uh, in section 9.1. Um, first, I want to begin with just two definitions. The first is the definition of something called a parameter, and the next is something called a statistic. Uh, a parameter is a number that describes a population, and notice there's a nice little kind of way to remember this. This P matches up with this P, parameter population. Uh, whereas a statistic is a number computed from a sample, so again, S matches up with S. Um, just a quick example, think about if I were to figure out the average height of all people in the world, well, that's a parameter, because the population is the entire uh, population of all people in the world. A statistic would be if I were to figure out the average height of, let's say, 100 randomly chosen people. In the case of all people in the world, I did it from the population, so that average would be a parameter, if it comes from a sample, uh, it would be a statistic. Now, I wrote here, in the real world, usually you don't know parameters, right? They're usually actually unknown. How would I possibly go about figuring out the average height of all people in the world exactly? I mean, I have to measure every single person, which would be impossible because people are being born, dying, growing, shrinking all the time. So it's very often in practice we don't know actually what parameters are. It's kind of just in theory. And that idea leads to an idea the term inference, which is what we're really the big topic of the entire second semester. Um, inference is using a statistic to estimate an unknown parameter. So in my example before, we have really no way of actually knowing what the height of all people in the world is. So we would take a sample of a few people, calculate the sample mean from that, those hundred people, that's a statistic, and then we would c kind of reason, well that statistic is going to be relatively close to the unknown parameter and we would be able to then estimate the average height of people in the world. That idea of inference, of using a statistic from a sample to estimate an unknown parameter from a population is really the big idea of the second semester. just wanted to talk about this. Um, there's kind of a notation in, used in statistics in which parameters um, from a population often end up getting used in Greek letters like mu and sigma, whereas statistics ends up uh, using kind of English letters like X bar and S. So just as an example, mu is the population mean. That's a parameter. X bar is a sample mean. That would be a statistic. Sigma is a population standard deviation. That's a parameter. S would be the standard deviation of a sample. That's a statistic. The only one that breaks down a little bit is here. P would be the uh, proportion from a population. You know, what proportion of people in the world can read? That would be a parameter, because your population is the entire world. Uh, we use p hat to indicate a sample proportion. Uh, that would be the, um, you know, you, t you asked a thousand people, can you read, and what's the proportion of those people? We do that actually because the Greek letter for uh, p is pi, which most mathematical people don't want to get, you don't want to get confused that pi is not always 3.14. Um, I should also mention, I didn't mention this before, that when I talk about parameters, I've been saying your population is the whole world. That doesn't necessarily need to be the case. You could define your population as like all sixth graders, right? Or all Sacred Heart students, or all residents of Redwood City. Um, population, parameters just come from the population you are talking about, which could be, you know, in some problem, all likely registered Republican voters or something like that. Um, so don't always think that the parameter comes from the, the population of the entire world. And we'll look at several examples of that. Okay, there's a lot of writing on this slide, but actually it's not, uh, it's an important idea. Um, it's not too bad. Chapter 9 is all about something called sampling distributions. When we talk about sampling distributions, we talk about the sampling distribution of a particular statistic. So the two I've chosen here, which are the next couple sections, are the sampling distribution of a sample mean, which is x bar, and the sampling distribution of a sample proportion, which is p hat. And this is like the post-it notes we put on the back of our uh, room one day. So the sampling distribution basically means you take many, many, many samples from a population. What can we say about the distribution of all those samples? So when we put those post-it notes that represented five women, if we had done many, many, many post-it notes, or really all possible post-it notes of five women, um, that would be the sampling distribution of x bar. So when you talk about sampling distributions, think it's the distribution, 
which basically means what shape is the, you know, the distribution uh, of all possible samples. So the sampling distribution of x-bar is the distribution of all values of x-bar in all possible samples of the same size from the population. Um, so that thing we did in the back was all possible uh, samples of five women. We can do a similar thing for, for proportions, the sampling distribution of the sample proportion p hat. You know, for example, if I said, okay, what my population is going to be uh, all high school students in the Bay Area, what percent of them own uh, an iPhone? So then if I did, okay, I'm going to take every possible sample of 25 Bay Area high school students and figure out of those 25 students what per percent have an, have an iPhone, I could then put a post-it note on it. In some samples, it might be 18 out of 25, and some it might be 12 out of 25, and some it might be 25 out of 25. The sampling distribution of p hat would be the distribution of all values of p hat, that's the sample proportion, in all possible samples of the same size from the population. And throughout chapter 9, we're going to look at what do we know about, it, about a sampling distribution. So again, what do we know about a sampling distribution? We're going to have some formulas like this. And I want to just kind of talk, before we even talk about what these formulas are, I just want to make sure we understand the notation. Here, the mu of x bar. This is the mean of all possible x bars. This is the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar. This means if you took every possible sample, what would the mean of all those samples be? Okay. Similarly, sigma of x bar means what's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Okay, let me write that down. I think it's kind of so important. Okay. This first one means the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar. This one is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of X bar. That's remember we did all those post-it notes on the back. We noticed how the sampling distribution gets the sorry the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which is what this is, gets smaller as your sample size increases. We notice the difference between those two graphs on the back. We can do a similar thing with what's the mean of p hat. That means what is the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat. That is, if you took all possible samples and figured out every single sample proportion, what would the mean be? And then similarly here, what's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat? And again, we'll have formulas for these things in a second, but the notation is so goofy, right? I mean, like, mu and x bar, mu of x bar, what does that mean, right? Mu itself is a parameter for the population. X bar is a statistic. So mu of X bar like combines both of those. It's neither really a parameter or a statistic. It's the mean of all possible X bars. Just a quick thing. We can now, now we have a little vocabulary where we can talk about a term we've used before where that term is bias, right? What do we mean by bias? Well, we talked about this a lot when we did sampling, when we did uh, experimental design. But as to, now we can actually have a little more vocabulary. A statistic is unbiased, meaning not biased, if the mean of the sampling distribution of the statistic is equal to its true value. So what that basically means is if mu of x bar, the mean of all possible samples, is equal to mu, then it is unbiased. Oh boy, unbiased. Okay? kind of a more formal way of talking about the idea of just playing no favorites, no favoritism. In other words, when you do all, po some samples will be far away from the mean, but on average, the mean of all the samples will be the mean of the population. Let me say that sentence again. On average, the mean of all the samples will be the same thing as the mean of the population. That's how we're going to talk about the idea of bias now. We're also going to talk about the variability of a statistic. In other words, like the variability of something like x bar or p hat. Okay, And I want to just talk about this a little bit. It's determined by your sampling design, and we'll talk about that a little bit in sections 9.2 and 9.3. But here's the super duper big idea, Okay, which is larger samples have less variability. We saw that with the post-it note activity. 
right? As you put each, as each post-it note represents more and more people as n increases, n is n is your sample size. Uh, the variability of the statistic or the, or the standard deviation of the sampling distribution decreases. When each one represented each post note represented five women, that's the graph became kind of more compact. Um, and obviously, if each one represented 25 or 100 or 1,000 women, it would have been even more compact. As you increase the sample size, okay, your sampling distribution has less variability. The exciting thing about this is your variability of a statistic does, has nothing to do with the size of the population, which is a really interesting idea. In other words, if you do a sample of 100 people, it doesn't matter whether your population is the entire world or whether it's the people in Redwood City. Okay? The variability of a statistic has to do with n. It does not have to do with the size of the population, which I think is sort of a counterintuitive idea because you think you need to actually ask more people to be more accurate if your population is a little larger. Right? If you want to figure out how do people vote for president um, and you want to do one sample of people in Redwood City in one of the, of the entire United States, doesn't it seem like you would have to ask more people to be more accurate if you're, if you're wanting your population to be the whole United States? It's actually not true. And the way I think about it is, imagine you had like a, um, a big bin of popcorn, right? And you want to take one scoop of popcorn out of this huge, like a bin of unpopped popcorn kernels and test, you know, which ones are actually good, right? Or, you know, or poppable, let's say. Well, that, if you, as long as your popcorn kernels are mixed up and you take one scoop, it doesn't really matter whether you're scooping out of like a big bin or like a whole warehouse full of popcorn, right? Your sample is really based on your sample size. It's not based on the entire population, okay? Now, that's true, and we're going to have some kind of rules of thumb. And the rule is as long as your population is at least 10 times your sample size, we don't care about this. Now, certainly if I take, if your size of your popcorn kernels were just like three scoops big, then we kind of would lose that idea of independence, right? But I think this idea that the variability of a statistic does not depend on the size of the population has real ramifications for, like, sampling for presidential elections. You can ask 100 people in Redwood City and 100 people in California and 100 people in the whole United States, and you'll be equally accurate. And that's basically Section 9.1.